last week, being able to talk about God works all things together for the good of those who love him, that's a, that's a great passage. It's encouraging. It is constructive. It is something that we enjoy hearing about. But this morning's passage in verses 29 and 30, maybe not so much, depending upon where you are and what your position is regarding predestination, foreknowledge, being called the elect, and there might be some of us in this room that say, oh no, here we go. <laughs> but as we come to every passage, we have a responsibility to submit ourselves to the scripture whether we like it or whether we don't, and to seek to understand what God is saying to us to exalt himself regardless of our thinking about how he's supposed to work things through. It is our way to affirm his authority and sovereignty in our lives when we come to the scripture in a way that says, okay, God, I don't like this, Help me. Help me understand it. Help me be able to align my thinking and my heart to what you say. Now, this, is not been, this is not a 21st century doctrinal concern. This is a 1st century to 21st century hardship. It is, uh, it is one of those doctrines, the doctrine of election and predestination and foreknowledge that, that has polarized sometimes uh, various individuals, caused fracture in relationships and confusion and heartache and different kinds of uh, approaches to the scripture. And yet, we have the responsibility, again, to what does the scripture say? How can we see it for what it means what is the consistency throughout the rest of the word and how can I align my heart? How can I align my heart to what God is trying to tell me? Two of my favorite theologians, George Whitfield and John Wesley, couldn't have been on further parts of the spectrum in relationship to these doctrines. George Whitfield was committed to foreknowledge and election and the predestination of the saints. John Wesley, on the other hand, was committed to free will. Both of these men were also committed to the gospel, committed in such a way that they expressed that commitment in, in taking the gospel on a consistent basis to the people who would listen. George Whitfield preaching for the first time in open air forums where anyone would assemble. Crowds as many as 30,000 individuals would come and hear the teaching of the scriptures from George Whitfield that he would preach every single day beginning in his 20s until the time that he died at 55. Somewhere over 18,000 sermons. That is extraordinary. His commitment to the gospel and seeking to usher people into a relationship with God and by uh, the time that he was, was finished at age 55, uh, he had preached the gospel to about 80% of all of America. About 80% of the people that lived in the colonies in America in the 1700s, heard George Whitfield in person as he preached the gospel. Now, John Wesley, who George Whitfield considers his spiritual father, was about 10 years his elder, but his maturity in love for God was also as pervasive. He preached two or three times a day. He rode on horseback all over England and Scotland, and Ireland, so that by the end of his life, he died, I think he was around 80 years old or so, 85 when he died, by the end of his life, he had ridden more than 250,000 miles on horseback. 
He had preached over 40,000 sermons. His affection for Christ and his love for the gospel caused him to speak about Christ wherever he went. And people came to faith because of John Wesley. George Whitfield, John Wesley, both committed to the scriptures, committed to the gospel, but couldn't be further apart on this doctrine, but also committed to relationship with one another. There was this affection and reverence for one another so that Whitfield referred to Wesley as his spiritual father and even Wesley preached at Whitfield's funeral when he died. That relationship continued. This morning, in our passage that we're coming to in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, begins to spell out the, the doctrines that we're going to describe this morning when we talk about election and predestination. It has challenged the church ever since the first century. And it is one of those doctrines that we, as God's people, must surrender to. And just as verse 28, God works all things out for the good of those who love him, speaks of God's sovereignty over all things, now we come to God's sovereignty in relationship to salvation. We must, in the same way, surrender our hearts to what the word says and marvel at who God is through the wonder of what he has accomplished for us. Let's read this. Let me read this for you. If you're with me in Romans chapter 8, I'm going to begin in verse 28, which will then spill in to verses 29 and 30. Here's what it says. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Right there at the beginning of verse 29, we find another connective word. We've been talking about these words ever since Romans chapter 1 and 2, that Paul, in trying, seeking to help make connections between thoughts and build his argument, his case for us, wants us to understand that the working together for good that we find in verse 29 is found as evidence in what God does for us in salvation. You want proof that all things work together for good? Well, let me now give you proof now in verse 29 and 30. We want to settle this case for you. We want to demonstrate that God will accomplish the things for you that lead to your best. We talked about that last week, that he is interested in your best. He's praying for your best. He's working for your best. He's sensitive for your best. Well, you can put stock in this because of what now what we find in verses 29 and 30. That in the most important work of all of eternity, accomplished in Jesus through redemption for his people, God is not leaving this up to chance. Just like he leaves nothing else up to chance. I want to develop this for us in at least two ways, and then follow it up at the very end with what does this do for us? First, I want to just explain the terms, and I want to just walk through them so that we can understand them, even though if you have done a study of these terms before, I want to help provide a fuller understanding of what these terms actually mean and how they relate to one another. Then I want to walk through just briefly the work of God in salvation for you, not just in initiating salvation and calling you to salvation, but in salvation's work itself, it is all bound up in God, who is not only the divine mover in moving us to salvation, but he is the one who enables it from every point along the way. I want you to see the consistency in that. And then I want us to just 
get a flyby on all of the Old Testament so you can see the consistency of this truth and how it relates to every other aspect of God's activity in our lives. And I want to follow it up at the very end with why is this good news? Why is this good news? First, the confirmation that all things work together for good. That's our first point this morning. The confirmation that all things work together for good. He begins this verse with the word for, which is a word to help you understand. Now here's the proof. Here's the evidence you've been looking for. Here's how you can understand and know for sure that God will truly work all things out together for good. And it began before history was even a consideration. It began before the world was even spoken into existence. It begins with this word, for new. This word, for new. The word itself means to know beforehand, to select in advance. Now, before we dig into this too much, I, I want to just make some observations about these five words that are bound together. They're inseparable in their unity with one another. I want you to understand that, that foreknowledge leads inevitably to glory. Do you see that? Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. This is a chain that God has initiated and that God will carry through to completion. It will not fail. It will lead to glory. If you are in Christ, it will lead to glory. He is the divine initiator. And every step along the way, he is leading us to glory. I want you to notice, second, that the subject of the sentence is not us. The subject of the sentence is he. It's God. He foreknew. He predestined. He called. He justified. He glorified. He is the actor. We are the acted upon. We are the recipient of his action towards us. We are the beneficiaries of his goodness, his goodwill towards us, his good plans towards us come to fruition because of God's divine initiative and action in our lives. And third, I want you to notice the tense of these words. I want you to notice that these words are all in the past tense. They're all an aorist tense in the Greek which designates action that has happened before, not, as, not action that is currently taking place. Things that have been settled, things that are complete, things that are done, things that are finished as far as God is concerned. Now picking up with foreknew. God knew beforehand. He selected in advance. To describe this a bit more, we find from Peter 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says this, He, speaking of Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you. Now, sometimes when we think about foreknowledge, some commentators would say, well, this is the fact that God knew omnisciently what's going to take place in the future, and then, because he knew it was going to happen, then he decided he would follow it up with sal salvation for those individuals. But if we understand the term correctly and how it's used in other places, we understand that Jesus, in being foreknown, was determined by God to be the person who would provide rescue. This foreknowledge includes determination. It includes actively being involved in the process of making it come to be. Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, and God in his eternal plan made it happen. He carried it through. In the same way, God foreknew those who would be saved, and he made it happen. 
One thing that might be beneficial to us is when we understand the word knowledge in the Bible. It is not just talking about knowledge of facts, but it's talking about the intimate kind of knowledge that leads to love. You might say that God set his affection on you. He pre-loved you. That would be the same as he foreknew you. You were foreloved. It says in Genesis chapter 4, 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. That's the kind of intimate knowledge that we're talking about, the kind of knowledge that is derived from relationship. God set his affection on those whom he foreknew. They were pre-chosen, pre-loved, and pre-acquired by him. This This knowledge of God was a knowledge of setting his affection on these individuals. We find that in 1 John. We love him because, what? He first loved us. God loved us first. The next term builds on the previous one, predestination. We're predestined. For those whom he knew, he also predestined. The next step in the chain This is to decide beforehand. It's a compound word made up of the word before and the word to determine. Predestined, to predetermine. Literally, it's to mark out or to appoint, to determine beforehand. Again, Peter used this word in his message on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. It says, Men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan, and this is the word, and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God from eternity past had a plan of how he was going to accomplish redemption for a fallen world. That plan was to send Jesus to come and to die for those who were sinners, to come and die for the world. And in that plan, he sent Jesus, and Jesus was not a stranger to the events that would unfold during the end of his life. He spelled it out on three different occasions to his disciples. In one occasion, in Luke chapter 18, he says this in verses 31 and 34. Taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Jesus was familiar with the details. He knew the people. He knew the events. He knew the timing. He knew the the specifics of what would happen. He was not a stranger to the predetermination of God who was not just determining what would happen, but was working it through. This predetermination then leads to calling that we find in verse 30. It leads to those who are called And those whom he predestined, he also called. Called is the word to summon or to call to one's self. Again, it is also a past work. It's something that has already happened. We've been called to him. And forming the next link of the verb uh, denotes God's effectual summoning of people into relationship. Not just calling them to salvation, but calling them to himself. Calling them to experience the intimacy of relationship that he, des- that he desires for them. This next piece of the unbreakable chain. The work of God in sanctifying them, in justifying them, in, in making them holy as God is holy. Initiated by this first call. We see this word used also in verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. It is the same word, the called out ones. We saw this word in verse 28. Those who were called according to his purpose. Those who were in Christ, they were called. And now we're going to find in a couple of verses from now that those who God called now can experience the the benefits of that calling, the work of God in their life to justify them and to secure them in salvation. That's our next term, justified, to be declared, to declare righteous and to put right with. We've talked about this since Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We talked about uh, the fact that, that God is, is the one who justifies us, and because of his justification, there is no condemnation for us. It's not because we don't deserve condemnation, but because of the work of Christ on our behalf to be righteous for us and to place that righteousness, credit it to our account. It's used 12 times, this word justification, is used 12 times in Romans 1 to 7. But now in, from, ver, from chapter 8 and on, it's not mentioned again because as far as Paul is concerned, justification is settled. And now we can look to glorification. We can look to the work of God in sanctification, which is what, is what happens in Romans 9 through the end of the book. We have been justified by faith. We are declared righteous not because of our own works, but because of the righteousness of Christ on our behalf. Justification, though, leads to glorification. We see that next. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word for praise, to speak words of glory, to give esteem, to mark out as one who who is worth honor, bestowing honor on this individual. Again, used in the past tense glorified action that has been completed in the mind of God it is already finished it's already done it's already uh, a work that has been finalized as far as Christ is concerned Paul talks about this a bit in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says we are seated with him in the heavenly places and the people in Ephesus must have been saying wait a second I'm right here how can I be there when I'm here And that's because in the mind of God, it was a settled matter. The work of Christ, the finished work of Christ in being seated with Christ and placed into Christ, he is at the right hand of the Father. And because he is there, and because I'm in him, I will also be there one day. It's a guarantee. The work of the Holy Spirit in sealing us for salvation and working sanctification into our life day by day. You think about glorification, we think about, often think about something yet future, and yet Paul wants us to understand that it is also a present reality as we are being moved from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18, he spells this out. He says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Those who are in Christ are being moved into glory day by day as Jesus, as the Spirit, is creating the image of Christ on our lives, helping to sanctify us, helping to conform us to the image of his Son, as we find in this verse. That is his prerogative, to help you look more like him to help lead you to glory, not only in a future life in heaven, but the life that you have today. That's the work of God in our life that starts at the very beginning in in initiating the process of salvation and leading us all the way through to the finished product. Now, maybe we can relate a bit with this, those of you who are parents. I think about uh, the nine months that you wait for that little child to be born. And there is this loving process that starts very early on. It doesn't happen just when that baby is, is in your arms. That, that loving process begins uh, very early on in the, in the stages of development. The first several weeks, there's not much to 
appreciate. But, but then, two months later, you can begin to, to feel this, this flutter of activity. You can, you can begin to, to tell that, that something's going on inside. And then as the development continues, there are then body parts that, that show themselves on the, the, the stomach of, of, of mother as, as babies are turning inside the womb. I, I can remember at least a couple of our kids, and you could see the elbow kind of scrape across the, the entire belly, and like, oh, there's a person inside. I can see that elbow or the, the kicking that's happening inside. And, and there's... Uh, for moms in, in, in particular, there, there is this, this is sacrificial giving of self and a relationship that's beginning to form at the, the very early parts of that baby's development. Maybe you're reading stories or maybe you're talking to that little baby inside the womb. Maybe you're reading scripture or praying prayers or listening to music or singing songs to this, this little one before before he or she shows themselves at the end of the process. In a similar way, God has set his affection on us before we even were born spiritually. He's carried us through, and he's going to carry us through all the way to glory. That is his prerogative. Now I want to look at the components, the components of his saving work. I want you to see a snapshot. We don't have time to, to develop this in detail, but I want us to see the snapshots of, of how God carries us along, not only in the saving work, uh, initiating salvation in our hearts, but at every point along the way. God is the one who enables salvation to happen from start to finish. I think I have just five components here. There are many others that we could share First, making us spiritually alive. That's the word regeneration. Making us spiritually alive. We find this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Where is the hope in that passage apart from God? There was deadness, lifelessness. And in case you didn't know, dead bodies don't respond to stimuli. They can't respond to spiritual truth. God has to make them alive. He has to regenerate them. It is a work of God alone in making us spiritually alive. He also helps us understand the truth. This is the theological word illumination. He informs our minds and helps us to perceive the truth that is in front of us. We see this in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 6. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Illumination. Seeing the truth for what it is. Being able to, to move past the blindness and the blinding of, of Satan. It is God who informs and opens our eyes and opens our minds to be able to see the truth, to discover it for what it is. He shines into our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ. Otherwise, you would not be able to perceive and you would not be able to respond. He illuminates us. He also makes us aware of sin. This is called conviction. John 16, 8. This is Jesus speaking with the disciples the night before he was crucified. It says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. 
But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Even conviction is a work of God in your life to help lead you to understanding, understanding where you really are in relationship to the holiness of God, recognition of how distant you are, how isolated you are, and how much you deserve judgment and condemnation. It is a work of the Spirit to make you aware of sin. Apart from his work, you would not know sin in your life. There's also helping us to believe. The process of faith is a process that is actually gifted to us by God himself. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, and that gift, of course, is a gift of faith given to you, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You believe because you receive the gift of faith, that gift of faith given by God so that you can trust in him once he has informed your, your, your vision on what the truth really is, convicted your heart of sin, led you in to trusting in him as, his personal, as your personal savior. And also forgiveness and cleansing. Titus 3.5. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You cannot clean yourself up. Don't imagine that you need to get your life put together before you come to him. That is his job. He wants to do it. He delights in do it, doing it. He gets glory in the washing and cleansing and forgiving process. Turn your sin, your burdens over to him. Let him do the work of cleansing and forgiving you from sin. And then, of course, lifting our prayers to God, intercession. We looked at this over the last couple of weeks, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. That is his ministry of lifting up our prayers to the throne, of helping us to communicate with God personally. He is that intercessor for us. He is the one who, who knows us intimately and is able to communicate to God those deepest longings, those deepest desires. We cannot pray if it were not for the Holy Spirit. We could spend time this morning talking about propitiation, imputation, mediation, reconciliation, representation, redemption, and adoption. All, again, the work of God for believers. Salvation from start to finish is his work, not ours, so that he gets the glory. We may not boast. It belongs to him. All the glory and praise for salvation, the way that he's able to work to accomplish redemption on, be, on, the, on the part of believers is only a credit to the work of God in our lives. He alone gets the glory. So maybe you're asking yourself the question, okay, this is okay. I understand the truth from this passage, but what about all of the other passages that talk about free will? What about the compatibility of this truth with that doctrine, which is also very true and very prevalent within the Scripture? How in the world can these seemingly competing truths align and complement one another? Explain to us the mysteries of free will and election, Andrew. <laughs> I don't plan to do that. <laughs> it's not possible. But I would like to bring to your attention just a few verses that help to reinforce the point that there is a measure of personal responsibility. And there is a, a measure by which we come to him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Who is doing that? I am. I'm coming to Christ. I'm laying myself down. I'm believing in the truths that he has communicated to my heart. I'm the one who is walking through that process. He has done a work on my soul and because of this, I respond. 
And what about all those verses that, that talk about whoever believes? Like in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, uh, one confesses and is saved. And here it is in verse 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And then a couple verses later, verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who is the whoever? We don't know. The whoever is whoever comes. The whoever is whoever believes. Are you one of those people? Are you one of those people that, that understands and has received a, a measure of clarity regarding the truth? Are you resistant and rebellious about that truth? Or are you coming to faith and surrender to the truth that you've been informed of? And what about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? He, he came and, and died for the world, right? How can the world not be the world, Andrew? And what about the verse that says, if you seek me, you will find me, from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek, seek for me with all your heart. And, and what about the, the verse that talks about God's desire that, that none should perish in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. These are parallel truths in the mind of God. In his infinite wisdom, it makes sense. In our limited and finite wisdom, we can't get it. We have no idea how to reconcile these two truths. But I, as I thought about this, my mind was reminded of the same truth related to the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Remember, is he the son of God or is he the son of David? Which one is it? Is he going to be the conquering king or is he going to be the suffering servant? Is he going to be is he going to restore the people of Israel? Or is he going to be the God of the nations? Is he going to rule forever? Or is he going to suffer and die? These two truths seem completely incompatible. But in the mind of God and as we, as uh, those who can look back on the work of Christ, we begin to understand how this picture is unfolding. We're like, of course, how did you not get that one? The same is true in relationship to God's foreknowledge and election and also the free will and personal responsibility we have as God's people to come, to bow and surrender. There is a will of God for us, but there's also a personal responsibility to submit ourselves to that will and to that truth. I don't understand it. I never will. But as those who love the scriptures, we are we must commit ourselves to surrendering to truths regardless of whether or not we understand them completely. Next, we come to the consistency of this truth with the rest of Scripture. What does the rest of Scripture have to say about the sovereignty of God in his activity in the lives of people? You've seen this graphic before. We talked about this. I pointed this out to you in our study through Ezra. We looked at this again in, in Isaiah. We see the initiative of God not only in, in knowing what will happen, but in working it through. In seeing what the future holds, predetermining what it's going to look like, and making sure that every single detail of that plan is worked out just the way God prescribed. He says, I will make... I have given, I will give, I will set, I will gather, I will bring, I will cause, I will destroy. 
This is God's sovereign, authoritative hand and working through every detail of life to accomplish exactly what he has decided and prescribed will take place. So that when you get to Ezekiel, there are 75 times where this phrase is seen, then they will know that I am the Lord because I am gonna tell you what's gonna happen and I'm gonna make sure every single detail that you thought was impossible happens just the way I prescribed. Every minute, microscopic detail that I have laid out will happen exactly the way I have set forth. That's the work of our sovereign God, working it through the consistency of Scripture and helping us see the same God who is the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament working through his plans to his glory. And finally, the cause for rejoicing. The cause for rejoicing. Why is this good news? And let me tell you, there couldn't be better news for you this morning. That God, who has initiated the process of salvation in your life, will carry it to completion. It is a guarantee. You cannot be lost. We're going to get there in a couple of weeks. He will not let you go. And since he has worked all of these things for your benefit, this is small potatoes. Uh, All of the other details of our life are small potatoes compared to this work of redemption for you. We'll find in verse 31, if God is for you, who can be against you? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him give us all things? This is great news. It should lead to an eruption of joy and settledness and confidence in the work of God for you. It should be explosive and pervasive and consistent. There should be this perpetual joy in our life because we know where God is taking us. It is certain he is working Christ conformity into your life. Everything that happens from day to day is for his glory and ultimately will lead to to a place of eternity and glorification with him. How can you not rejoice over that? This truth should also give you a zeal for missions because you cannot fail as a missionary. If God has set his affection on people and you are taking the gospel to them, it doesn't really matter how much theology, I wanna be careful, yes, you need to know theology, but don't feel like you're unqualified if God has done a work in your life. God will use the the bits and pieces of of the fragments of our life and our testimony to draw people to faith in him. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's his work. You cannot fail. That should propel you into missionary endeavors. This truth should also anchor your soul in the sovereignty of God knowing that regardless of of what you are going through from day to day, that all things work together for your good and for your best and for his glory. As he has worked in salvation, he's working for glorification in your life. Everything in life is working out just the way he is designed. Submit yourself to it. Trust him in the midst of it. This truth should also help you in your patience with others. How is that possible? It's possible because you realize that the same work that God has done on your scoundrel heart is the same work that he can do in every scoundrel heart that is coming against you. Every opposition, every conflict, every adversity that you face, God is in control and he can work it through. Be faithful. Submit to him. Trust him in the process. And this truth should lead you to humility. Because you bring nothing to the table. All of your working for God in your ministry, all of your, the, the righteousness that he's working through in you, all of the, the strength and, and enablement in relationships, 
all of the, the blessings and favor and, and benefits that you face, you experience, is a work of God for you. And you have perhaps partnered with him in the process, maybe submitted yourself to his will and guidance for you along the way, but at the end of the day, it is his work. It's his work from start to finish. Maybe this morning, there are some today who do not know Jesus. You have sensed the convicting work of his spirit. You have, you have sensed that, 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 that all the things that I have shared this morning from the scripture are true. There is a, a measure of illumination taking place. Allow the work of God to help finish that process in your life. That he would lead you to faith. There is a, an inward call. That's the call we were talking about this morning. That inward call of God on your life. But there is also an outward call that we find in Romans chapter 10. That we're called to, to preach the, the gospel because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they be able to believe unless they've heard? So this morning, if you're hearing and God has been calling you to faith, don't walk out of here without making that relationship firm and final. Bow yourself before him today. Don't waste another moment as God is seeking to carry you to glory and work out his purposes in your life. Don't allow another day to go by without spending it in relationship with him. Let me pray for us and I'll close our time.